Hi, everyone. Welcome to Conduct Vision Talks. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Stephen Bryant, violinist and leader of the BBC Symphony Orchestra. As concertmaster, Stephen collaborates with leading world conductors, appears as soloist, and teaches at all four London music colleges. He also sits on the panels of the BBC Young Musicians Competition, Royal Philharmonic Society Awards, and Help Musicians UK. At Conduct Vision, we believe that the orchestra is a great example of leadership, organizational structure, teamwork, and collaboration. Looking to get an insider's view on this, I asked Stephen to join me and discuss different aspects of the orchestra. Stephen, can you tell us what does an orchestra leader actually do? Well, it's a very good question, Vivi. Um, the orchestra leader or concertmaster, which is exactly the same thing, um, also leads the first violins and sits just to the left of the conductor. So leaders have quite a few responsibilities. They have to prepare bowings for the music. Um, they have to play the violin solos. They um, have to look after discipline in the orchestra. Uh, they sit on panels to recruit new members. They tune the orchestra with the assistance of the principal oboe. But I think their most important role is as a, a link or a, a conduit between the conductor and the orchestra. And this works in two different ways. First of all, by dialogue, which is pretty obvious, I guess. And secondly, and this is more complicated, the leader interprets the conductor's gestures and translates that into physical movement which is then seen by the rest of the orchestra. So it's a complicated business playing in a big symphony orchestra. Uh, you have players, they will be watching the conductor first, first and foremost. They will be watching the leader. They will be watching their uh, section principals. To a degree, they will be watching each other. And everybody, of course, is listening very hard as well. So it's a... Uh, it's an unusually skillful um, set of qualities that one needs to do this. Interesting. So, because the classical orchestra has uh, is very hierarchical. So you have the conductor, the leader, section leaders, the orchestra player. So you mentioned, so the orchestra player needs to follow the section leader, the leader, you, and then the... Uh, conductor. So how does that actually work? Isn't that confusing sometimes? Yeah, it's confusing if um, it's confusing if the leader and the conductor are not working together. Mm -hmm. So if the if the leader decides that he or she knows better, um, then already you have problems. But the, um, I mean, maybe we we might talk about this a bit later on. But the the role of a leader with a conductor is to help them, not, not hinder them. So you're, you're there to, everybody is there, the orchestra, the leader, the conductor, everybody is there for one purpose, which is to get the absolute best possible result, musical result. So if you look at it that way, it would be crazy for anybody's ego to kind of get in the way and start saying, I know better than you or whatever. So you try and work as best you can with the conductor and you try and help him or her as much as possible. Everybody else then in, in the pecking order, as you, you described, and there is a very strong pecking order in an orchestra, everybody else must go with that. If they don't agree, then they, of course, we can discuss it, but at that point, everybody has to go together. It's, it's, that's the hardest thing about an orchestra, that you're trying to create um, a single entity, if you like, out of 80 people. So everybody thinks the same, everybody plays at the same time, everybody engages at the same time. So it's, it's complicated, and that's why 
if you go and listen to a bad orchestra, it can sound terrible. I mean, really terrible. <laughs> but if you go and listen to a great orchestra, then it's amazing because everybody is, is that entity. What would you say is you mentioned now a bad orchestra. Yeah. What really makes the orchestra great, in your opinion? I think, first of all, quality of players. Um, I think you can pretty much say nowadays that all the established professional symphony orchestras, they have incredible high quality players. So, so there's that to start off with. Um, I think also um, you have to have the right approach. Um, my orchestra, the BBC Symphony Orchestra, I, I know probably anybody look, uh, listening to this is going to say, oh, well, he's, he's bound to say that. But I actually think that the, the sort of the spirit of the orchestra is quite special because it's, it's very... People are very, very serious about the end result, about the concert, the recording, whatever it is, but they don't take themselves too seriously, if, if that makes sense. So it's a great combination because it means that the egos, of course, everybody has an ego. Uh, the ego is always there, but egos don't tend to get in the way because people are not taking themselves too seriously. And they want, they're simply looking at the end result, which is how good can that, you know, that symphony, that concerto, that recording be. Um, so to answer your question, I think, I think you can take as a, as a normal, really, that the players are going to be top quality in pretty much every orchestra. What you can't always guarantee is the spirit and the teamwork. It, it would be like an expensive, mm -hmm. sorry. Who's then, who's responsible for creating that um, spirit? The leader, the section principals, the chief conductor. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you have, and I mean, I've seen this be, because although I look terribly young, uh, um, I have been around, I've been around for a long, long time. Um, so yeah, I've been but you are young. Oh, well, it's kind. But I mean, I've been doing this for nearly 30 years because mm -hmm. uh, I started when I was quite young. Um, and you can see in various orchestras, you can see if you have a leader that doesn't have the right approach, isn't there for the right reasons, or if you have principles, even if you have a chief conductor that isn't really there for the right reasons, it can, it drags everybody else down you set the tone as a leader for instance you set the tone for the whole orchestra if you turn up you're not prepared you look fed up you look as though you'd rather not be there how can you expect anybody else to to be ultra professional to be prepared and to look engaged you you, you can't so it's terribly important that those people are kind of almost beyond reproach if if that's possible okay. um when you now for example hire a new member audition yeah. for a new member um can you just briefly tell us about the process and what you actually look for in a new member of the orchestra okay um the the process is i i guess is relatively straightforward we we will advertise a job um usually just the one job at a time um we will probably get, on average, we get about 200 applicants for that one job. Um, we then look through the CVs and we, we pick, we, we, we short this basically from, from looking at the CVs. Um, I'm very much somebody that likes to try out as many people as I can because I, my feeling is you, you never know. And, you know, somebody may have just left music college, they have no experience, but they might be brilliant, in which case, you know, some people are so brilliant that it's almost like the lack of experience doesn't matter, they're so fast. So I like to hear as many people as possible. Um, we will then listen to those people, 
um, we would choose who we want to go through to the orchestra for a trial period. So they will come and the trial period can last for anything from a couple of months to even a year, year and a half. So they will come in for work that we choose. They will be moved around the sections or rather the, the section, um, sitting next to hopefully all the people in the, the section. They will sit on the front desk um, and they will be judged. And on which basis? Um, do you look more on technical skills, uh, musical competencies, or um, are there other factors like attitude, how they get along with other um, players in the orchestra? Yeah, absolutely. Um, technical aptitude is, again, pretty much a norm. It's, you would be surprised if anybody turned up who wasn't technically very, very good. I guess we're looking more for the musical side. We're definitely looking for the right attitude because once you appoint somebody, um, they could be there for many years and you want somebody who is really, who, who ideally who doesn't want to do anything apart from play simply orchestral repertoire, you mm -hmm. know, who's just dying to be in an orchestra to do that. So, um, and to a degree, I think you look at how they get on with other people, but um, I would say that that's not such, as long as they're not going around upsetting everybody left, right and centre, that's not such a, a big issue. If, you know, if somebody's quiet and withdrawn, I, I don't think that matters myself. Is there a balance between, let's say, more extrovert, introvert members? How would you describe like the at general atmosphere amongst players? I think, um, you mean amongst players generally or? Uh, yes, in the orchestra, yes. I mean, every, every section of the orchestra has, I, I would say, different characteristics. Mm -hmm. And it's quite funny because they're, to, to me, they're, they're quite obvious. The first violins are quite, can be quite highly strung, um, always talk very fast. It's like their brains are whizzing mm -hmm. all over the top. Um, second violins are always very calm and sort of very balanced people. Viola players are always slightly mad. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I won't go through the whole orchestra, but um, there's definitely, there are characteristics, but um, as to extrovert and introvert, in a, in a way, that doesn't really affect playing, I don't think. I mean, we, we talked about Heifetz earlier in another conversation. Mm -hmm. Heifetz was, you listen to Heifetz playing, his playing is like, unbelievably in your face exciting incredibly sort of visceral really i always think of as a, as a good word and yet he was an introvert as a person he was very quiet he was very self-contained he was very private so the actual personality i don't think matters it certainly doesn't contribute to the way people play um socially i guess it's nice to have a to answer your question finally mm -hmm. um I, I guess it's nice to have a balance um but i i think i probably think mostly in terms of you know the musicians and how, how people are as instrumentalists and musicians uh, you made here lovely points one thing very i think uh, for our viewers which will be very interesting is that when you mentioned about um when auditioning and hiring a new member about thinking how that the person will be there for a number of years for a long time and this is something um in business for example they don't think that way okay. it's lacking in a way because the turnovers are so fast generally Right. I think this is something very important in lot for the long term success of any organization. Yes, I think you've got to have. I mean, I'm I'm no expert on business whatsoever, um, but certainly for 
an orchestra or an ensemble, a string quartet even, uh, you, you ha I think you've got to have some kind of continuity. I think it's very important because people grow as musicians all throughout their life. And if you're working together, then you, you need to grow together as well. If you have a constantly changing personnel, it, it, I think it, that would make it very difficult. Now that's the challenge. That's the challenge of many um, teams in other industries today. Yeah. I think that's an excellent lesson that they can learn for, for music. I found it very interesting. I have to thank you very much for mentioning about the character, actually, what you said about the first violin, second violins. Yeah. Because they correspond to uh, one of my ideas that I included uh, in, in my programs and in my course, um, How to Orchestrate Your Business, is what instrument are you? Right. Because also as a violinist, um, I know my colleagues, fe fellow violinists, we're all kind of similar. Yeah. My sister is a pianist. My uh, Some colleagues are pianists. And I realized they're quite similar. Pianists have something in common. Yeah. So um, the instrument, interestingly, uh, shows also our character. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's a bit like, you know, this idea that people resemble their pets after a few years. It's kind of <laughs> the same sort of idea, I think. <laughs> uh, but, but that's... Uh... Uh, um, that's true. Uh, one question. Um, what are today's challenges in, for an orchestra? When you ask that question, do you mean, are we talking in a, a sort of a business sense or are we talking in a, in a musical sense? Well, a bit, actually a bit of both. Um, but um, let's, let's put the, start with the business uh, challenge. The business, um, I guess the challenge nowadays is uh, to find enough funding for orchestras. Um, and that, the, the, the problem with that kind of struggle is that I think sometimes programs and what's put in the programs um, are compromised because an orchestra needs to make money. So therefore, they won't necessarily put on a concert with a, a brand new contemporary work because probably they're not gonna get as many people in the audience as they will if they put on 1812 Overture, Tchaikovsky, or uh, you know pieces like that. And I think I, I completely see why orchestras have to do that because they have to keep going. Um, but I think it's, I think it's a danger. Um, so th that's, I think that's the only sensible comment I can make from a business point of view, really. And from a musical? I... From a musical, I mean, um, I, I don't think that the problem is always um, getting, I, I'm repeating myself, but getting 80 people to to play together as a as a unit, that's the most that's the most difficult thing. Um, but I was going to say earlier that um, one of the really great things about music, I I feel, is that um, the the rules for being a musician, being in that industry, are very very simple. It simply relies upon how good you are as a musician that's that's it maybe personality comes into it a bit but basically just a musician and that's what's wonderful about it it doesn't matter what gender you are it doesn't matter what sexual orientation you are what what color skin you have whether you've got three arms two heads it's completely irrelevant and i think that's that's a pretty wonderful thing and and if that could be the same in you know all over the world in different things that would be it would be a much better world for it. I agree. I agree. Well, Stephen, thank you very much for this insightful and inspiring talk and wishing you all the best. Thanks, Bibi. Thank you for asking.